Hi. I'm Sam, and introductions are a waste of time. Can you beat Pokemon Scarlet using only non-damaging status moves? Let's find out. But first, a briefish explanation. Status moves in Pokemon are divided into two categories. Volatile and non-volatile. A non-volatile status will remain after being switched out and after a battle ends. An icon will be displayed under the Pokemon's name, indicating that it is under the effect of a non-volatile status. Volatile status effects are lost when a Pokemon switches out of battle or when battle ends. Here are the ones considered volatile. A Pokemon can only be under the effect of one of these at any given time. And here are the ones considered non-volatile. More than one volatile status may be active at any given time alongside one non-volatile status condition. Eight of these statuses, five volatile and three non-volatile, will likely be the bread and butter of our strategy going forward. They are Sleep This puts the opponent to sleep for one to three turns. While asleep, they cannot take any action. Paralysis This paralyzes the opponent causing their speed to drop by 50% and there is a 25% chance that they will lose a turn to paralysis. Poison. This causes the opponent to take one-eighth of their total health as damage at the end of each turn. Bad poison. This causes the opponent to take one-sixteenth of their total health as damage on the first tick, increasing by one-sixteenth on every subsequent tick. Burn. This causes the opponent to take 1 16th of their total health as damage at the end of each turn. It also reduces the damage of all physical moves by 50% and, as of Generation 5, this no longer applies to confusion damage, which is potentially relevant to this challenge. Leech Seed This causes the opponent to have 1 8th of their health drained at the end of each turn and heals your current Pokémon by the amount drained even if it is not the one that originally seeded the opponent. Confusion There is a 33% chance that the opponent will hit themselves in confusion. Curse This one is only useful if used by a ghost type. When used by a ghost type, this move causes the user to lose one half of their total HP and places a curse on the opponent. This curse causes the opponent to lose one-fourth of their total HP at the end of each turn. Here are the rules for this challenge. 1. We can only use moves that do not deal direct damage. 2. No items in battle. Held items are allowed. 3. No Terra Starlizing. 4. No duplicate Pokémon in party. 5. No raid Pokémon. 6. No letting lead Pokemon out to roam and battle as I explore. 7. Progress through the game must follow the expected path based on level of gym leader, team star, or titan Pokemon. And with all that settled, we're off. The game starts as it normally would. We decide what we look like, we meet our mom, an old man shows up and has tea with our mom and we spend a short walk and a cutscene with the three starter Pokémon before we finally get to pick one. And now for the first meaningful decision in the challenge. Which starter do we pick? There's Quaxley, the water type. There's Sprigatito, the grass type. And there's Fuecoco, the fire type. Let's compare them. Each starter has 310 base stats. Each middle evolution has 410, or in the case of Kra Kalor, 411. Each final evolution has 530. Nothing decisive there. The stat distribution, on the other hand, gives Fuecoco an edge when our strategy is taken into account. We're going to be doing a lot of status effect the enemy and tank until it dies. This means we want high HP, high defense, and high special defense. We don't care about things like attack and special attack. Taking a look at the stat distribution, Fuecoco easily comes out on top. But is that enough? We can probably pick up another Pokemon to tank early and there are certainly better tanks later in the game anyway. Well, let's look a bit deeper. Do any of them naturally learn a status-only move that might be useful? 
the sprigatito, florigato, miauscarada line learns home claws, grassy terrain, and worry seed. We can't use attack moves so home claws is useless. Grassy terrain might have some niche application. And worry seed doesn't help us in any way that I can see. On to the Quaxley, Quaxwell, Quaquaval line. This one is even worse. It learns work up, focus energy, and feather dance. And lastly we take a look at the Fuecoco, Krakalor, Skeledurge line. It learns yawn, raw, scary face, and will-o-wisp. Well, looks like we have a winner when it comes to move zets for a starter. Each of these has at least some potential to be useful throughout the game, even though it doesn't learn any of them at early levels. So it seems like Fuecoco and its evolutions are a no-brainer. Surely there has to be some downside, right? There is. Nimona, our rival friend, whose name Google Docs keeps autocorrecting to pneumonia, will choose the starter whose type is weak to the typing of our chosen starter. Normally this is great. A grass type to go against our fire type is great for us. But we aren't doing direct damage, so the offensive side of the type advantage doesn't help us at all, and the defensive side of that matchup is not all that important, especially since, when we finally have to beat her Meowscarada, it knows Shadow Ball which is super effective against Skeledurge anyway. But there is an upside to this downside, you almost never actually have to beat Nimona. So we're going with Fuecoco and we didn't even consider how good the Fire plus Ghost typing of the final evolution actually is. And it is really really good. We promptly lose to Nimona for the first of many times. The game clearly doesn't expect you to lose this fight. But thankfully it still allows you to lose it or this challenge would be dead right here. Catching tutorial, meeting the box legendary, losing to Arvin, Poke Center tutorial. Now we need to build a team around Fuecoco who is literally only useful as a meat shield at this point. There are some obvious ones. Hopip gets three useful status moves at level 10 and we can catch one at level 7. Ghastly has ghost typing and low level access to confuse and sleep. Wiglet has sand attack. Rolts has double team. And Igalibuff has sweet kiss, sing, and defense curl. There's our 6. After a bit of item hunting and leveling by catching, the most reliable way of leveling early on in this challenge, Hopip hits 10 and we are ready to progress. And also ready to make a mistake. See for some reason, I convinced myself that the Nimona fight right before entering the city was a required win. So I spent almost 20 minutes trying to win it. I had horrible luck getting her Sprigatito to hit itself and multiple one-turn duration confuses. But finally I managed to get it to take itself down. But her terrestrialized poor me did too much damage and won the race against Poison. Still, this gave me a lot of confidence in our team composition going into the next fight which is actually a must win. And must win we do. Shrewdle cannot be poisoned, so the strategy is to land as many sand attacks as possible before Wiglet dies. Swap to a glee buff and confuse with sweet kiss, then use defense curl to survive and waste turns before reapplying confusion as needed. Well this doesn't go quite as planned because a glee buff has cute charm and the shrewdle becomes infatuated, so we swap to ghastly and continue the strategy from there. Shrewdle is nice enough to hit itself quite often, and, rather painlessly, the first half of the encounter is over. Now we gain the ability to terrestrialize but we can't, and also our Pokemon are fully restored. We face off against Yungoose, and, after using a few sand attacks for extra safety, we finally get to use our poison and tank strategy. Hopip poisons. Rolts double teams and survives. And, when Yungoose finally knocks Rolts out, it takes fatal poison damage right after and we win. Since we are not allowed to terrestrialize here, we also learn that there is a bit of dialogue that mentions that we didn't. And it's off to school and then to freedom and a whole hell of a lot more options. And I have a feeling we are going to need them. School's out for summer, and it is time to look for a shuppet. We do a bit of item collecting on the way because I have a hard time not picking up shiny things. 
Also I guess if we need money, having all this junk will come in handy later. It takes me a while to find a shop it. And when I do, I pick the lowest level 1 to keep the challenge as interesting as possible. So now we have a level 19 shop it with Willow Wisp, our only reasonable access to this move until later in the game and the only move that provides the burn status without doing direct damage in the process. I catch shop it for this move, but, as we'll soon see, it has an entirely different move that will actually save the day. I make a quick detour for a whooper. It's level 5 so it won't be useful now. But at level 12 it gets toxic spikes, a guaranteed poison on almost any Pokemon that swaps into battle. And if we lay down two layers of spikes, this will change to the badly poisoned status. So I want to get it some shared experience in the upcoming gym, since grinding four levels is so tedious in this challenge. We roll an olive real good, and then start our fight with Katie, the bug type gym leader. She leads with Nimble and we lead with Shuppet and Inflict Burn before switching to Ralts. I want to get in a few double teams and hope for some misses while Burn does its thing. This does not work out. Two struggle bugs take us down to 4 HP. We get one double team off, the next struggle bug lands, and Ralts is dead. Fuecoco goes down next and Nimble is still sitting at around 1 8th of its health. Jigglypuff is next, and Defense Curl Spam keeps it alive long enough for Burn to take out Nimble right after it takes out Jigglypuff. But we lost three Pokemon just to take out one of hers. Not off to the best start. She sends out Tarantula and we send out Hopip. I throw out a Poison Powder even though for some reason I've convinced myself that all of her Pokemon are immune to poisoning. Well they aren't. At least the spider isn't. I still don't know about Nimble and Teddy Ursa. I stall for a bit, and, through that stalling, I discover the actual reason I should have wanted Shop It. It knows Spite and Spite is really fucking good here. Her final Pokemon is Teddy Ursa. We get Wooper some much needed EXP. And we lose. Second try. We swap out Ralts because that wasn't working. Struggle Bug does too much damage. But we do want it to miss. Maybe Wiglet can solve that problem with Sand Attack. It can't. Wiglet is dead in my party and also in my heart. But hey, we can poison Nimble so we cut the number of turns it is alive from 16 down to 8. And we spite with Shup it until its Struggle Bug is out of PP. Now it has to use double kick and that can't hit shop it so we get to the Tarantula with 5 of our Pokemon still alive and another level on Wooper. We swap in Hopip and immediately poison the spider before switching to Jigglypuff. Some more defense curl spam and a really nice cute charm proc towards the end gets us to Teddy Ursa with quite a bit left in the tank. But not enough. We don't get the poison on Teddy Ursa so we have to swap to shop it and burn it. Surviving 16 turns just isn't going to work with what we have left. We die again. But not before figuring out that we can burn just enough of its fury cutter uses to have it run out before we are all dead. See, once it is out of fury cutter, all it has is fury swipes, and, unlike fury cutter, fury swipes cannot hit a ghost type. Goodbye Wiglet, hello Ghastly, the 29 HP tank. Because, you can't die to what can't hit you. We poison and spite nimble. We get really unlucky and miss the first poison powder against Tarantula. The second one hits but Hopip is down to 4 HP. Luck favors us as Jigglypuff's cute charm procs immediately this time. Tarantula goes down. We keep Jigglypuff in knowing that the only chance to land poison on Teddy Ursa is to confuse it and have it hit itself on the turn that we switch to Hopip. This doesn't work. Hopip is dead. We burn with Shuppet and get to spiting that PP. Back to Jigglypuff because it still has a few Fury Cutter uses to burn through. Then to Wooper to let it use the last one. Now it's out of PP and it is time for Ghastly to shine. It can't hit us and it is dying to burn. But not before it finally hits itself in confusion and knocks itself out. 
33% chance my ass. But anyway, we win. First badge down, and now it is on to the next gym. We finish playing the worst game of hide and seek and start the fight with Gracias. The first attempt is doomed from the start. We cannot poison any of his Pokemon and Petalil tears through our entire party while out healing burn with Mega Drain. That move has 15 pp and we cannot reasonably expect to spite all that away while maintaining enough to manage Brassius's next two Pokemon. So it's time for a new strategy. At level 20, Ghastly gets Curse. And it isn't going to hurt to get a few levels on the rest of our team anyway. So it's grind time. Catching is still the best way, especially if we can land a sleep first for the improved catch rate. But it doesn't always go well. Though, with three rare candies, at least we only need to get Ghastly to level 17. This still takes over 30 minutes. But along the way our Hopip evolves into Skiploom, Fuecoco evolves into Krakalor, and Ghastly learns Spite, meaning that we can potentially box shop it for a bit more defensive type coverage without losing access to any moves. And finally, we're there. Back to the gym. It goes so much better. We curse Petalil and switch back to Skiploom to stall so Petalil cannot restore much health with Mega Drain. It only manages to extend its life by one extra turn and it's down. Next is Smoliv. We switch back to Ghastly and die in order to curse Smoliv before once again sending Skiploom out to stall. His last Pokemon is Pseudo Widow the Trudo Widow. It terrestrializes into a grass type and we're far enough ahead that I can make the dumb move of trying to poison it which doesn't work. Ghastly is dead, so it's burn time. After Shop it goes down we swap to Jigglypuff and apply Confusion. We get incredibly lucky and Pseudo Widow hits itself on 3 out of the next 4 turns. Maybe it is, 33%, my ass. Jigglypuff is still alive and we want the EXP so we swap to Krakalor and wink at it until Burn takes it down. We now have the second gym badge and our Skiploom knows Leech Seed. We're that much closer to realizing our true power in this run. Time to take on a few titans. First is Cloth, the Stony Cliff Titan. It's level 16, and susceptible to everything we have at our disposal. In round 1, we easily win with Poison and Leech Seed. On top of the heal from Leech Seed, we have 5 uses of Synthesis for even more healing. On to round 2. Arvin joins us and his shelter is actually useful here, though we really don't need it to be. Even though Cloth now has double the HP and hits harder, the combination of Poison and Leech Seed is still dealing one-eighth of its total health bar as damage per turn while healing us slightly. Throw in a Synthesis and Skiploom is the only Pokemon we need. Titan 1, down. Of course we give Koridan the sandwich, he's cute and he's a good boy and we love him. After the cutscenes end, we can now dash while riding Koridan. So we dash off to fight Bombardier, the open sky titan. The plan was to lead round 1 with Skiploom and get off the poison plus leech seed combo before switching to something tankier and letting the magic happen. The magic immediately goes out the window. Pluck one shot Skiploom and we have to settle for burning it. But even with the attack cut from the burn status, it just does too much damage and we lose. Back to the drawing board. If we can't outspeed it with Skiploom and it will one shot with Pluck, poison is off the table. That leaves us with burn. So we lead with Shup it and burn it on turn 1, then spite until Shup it goes down. We send out Jigglypuff and confuse it. Even if it doesn't hit itself once, Jigglypuff brings nothing else of use to this fight, so its HP is well spent here. But it does. Hit itself once before snapping out of confusion and taking down Jigglypuff. We switch in Skiploom, get hit by Rock Throw, and manage to seed it. The next Rock Throw misses, we heal to full with Synthesis, and it goes down to the combined damage of Leech Seed and Burn. We're through round 1 and Ghastly is still alive. I'm pretty sure there is no way we lose at this point. 
and we don't, even though our currently entirely useless whooper gets sent out first due to it being in second position in our party. Curse is just too good. We swap to Ghastly, survive one attack, and get the curse off. Ghastly goes down but it doesn't matter. With curse ticking and Arvin's Narkly landing super effective smackdowns, the bird goes down a few turns later. Now we can go across water while on Karaidan. And we meet the bestest boy in the whole wide world, Arvin's Maboss Tiff. The entire Arvin story is my favorite out of all the mainline Pokemon games. But this isn't about the story. On to the next encounter and our first team star base. We approach the base and meet Clive, our fellow student who is totally not Director Clavel. Now that Wooper has toxic spikes, we'll try to lead with it on any trainer that has two or more Pokemon. This one doesn't and I forget to swap before the fight. Our poisoner goes down, so we reset. On our second try, we miss poison and Ghastly goes down. Another reset. This Mercrow is kinda scary. But you can bait out Haze, a non-damaging attack, if you use stat changing moves 2 to 3 times, and more turns alive means more turns where they are dying. On the third try, we outlive its damage and it goes down. The base raiding mechanic is not fun or interesting. We slog through it and start our battle with the boss of Team Star's dark base. This one sucks. A lot. Pornyard is solvable even if it hits hard. We sleep it with Skiplume, curse it with Ghastly, and switch back to Skiplume to Leech Seed and Synthesis until it goes down. But on our first attempt, we learn that Toxic Spikes does not work on the Starmobile. I wasn't sure if the standard typing of Revarv Room would carry over to the Starmobile in any way. And to be honest, after what I learned going forward in this fight, I am still not sure if it does. But anyway, we lose a few more times. Learning that more and more of our status moves don't work against the Starmobile. No burn, no poison, no sleep, no leech seed. So it all comes down to curse. First though, we have to get Ghastly to a level where it outspeeds the Starmobile. That means getting Ghastly to evolve into Haunter. The extra levels and reliance on Haunter for the Starmobile also leads to a better strategy against Pornyard. We sleep it, leech seed it, stall on any turns where it is still asleep, synthesis for health when we need it, and re-sleep it when it wakes up. It goes down slow, but easy. But guess what? Here's where shit gets real. None of that matters, because when we finally have a chance to curse the Starmobile, we learn that even that won't help us. The goddamn thing is immune to literally all volatile and non-volatile status effects in the game. So can you beat Pokemon Scarlet with only status moves? No. But I'm sure you've seen that the video is a lot longer than it would be if the run stopped here. I'm not letting it end here. It's been too much fun solving the fights and figuring things out. So we take the car down with attacks that cause direct damage and continue the run. After a bit of research, I learn that the Starmobiles also have infinite PP, so you cannot even stall them and force them to use struggle until they knock themselves out. So now I feel even less bad about punching the stupid car to death and continuing the run. On to Levinshia and the electric gym leader, Iono. But first, we have another rematch with Nimona. I'm pretty sure you can lose this and keep going but figure that winning it is worth the time for the EXP we'll get out of the fight. It's nothing exciting or interesting so I'll just give the basics. We lead with Claude Sire for Toxic Spikes. Poison Point Prox and Rockruff is poisoned so we tank with the Claude until he goes down then switch to Skiplume to finish it off. Poor me is next and two layers of Toxic Spikes badly poison it on swap. We seed it and survive until it goes down. Her last Pokemon is Floragato and it is immediately badly poisoned. Skiplume goes down but Krakalor comes in to tank the last few hits and we win. We do the Where's Waldo Gym Challenge and the two trainer fights are easily taken down. We swap to keep everyone alive for the EXP these fights give. Iono is next and even though we're a bit overleveled from the star base journey, 
This one is actually a struggle. We lead with Claude Sire and put down two layers of toxic spikes. We swap to Skiploom but it goes down after Leech Seed misses. We do manage to get to Miss Magius but it outspeeds Haunter and we lose. On to attempt number two. But first, it's time for a slight change in team composition. Jigglypuff is not feeling all that useful at this point. Sleep is really only useful as a setup for Curse or Leech Seed, and Skiploom has Sleep and Leech Seed so we don't have to lose a turn swapping for the setup. Confusion isn't all that reliable, and, if we really need it, Haunter has it as well. And Jigglypuff is not really tanky enough for Defense Curl to earn it a spot on our team at this point. There aren't a lot of good options from what we've caught at this point. We need something that brings at least one status effect and hopefully at least one other redeeming quality. Lucky for us, Dugtrio brings a status effect and multiple other redeeming qualities. On top of being a ground type against an electric gym, Sand Attack and Growl both have at least some potential in the Iono fight. And on top of that, Dugtrio is fast. Though I don't have a great feeling about relying on misses to win, it still seems better than relying on Jigglypuff for anything in this fight. So Jigglypuff is on the bench and Dugtrio is in. And round 2 with Iono begins. Once again we lead with Claude Sire for Toxic Spikes. Poison Point procs this time around and we just keep Claude Sire in until he faints. We send in Hariyama to tank the last few hits while Poison takes the Watrol down. Now this means that Hariyama is going to get hit with two super effective plucks. But we just have to live with that. Everyone else has something they are needed for in the fight and we can't risk them going down. Bellabolt is in and is immediately badly poisoned. Hariyama tanks a few water guns before going down and all is going according to plan so far. We send in Skiploom next and use Leech Seed. After a few turns and one synthesis to get us as close to full HP as possible, the Bellabolt goes down. We get an unlucky turn loss to Paralysis against Luxio, and, honestly, I felt like this was probably the end of the attempt. But we send in Dugtrio and start our sand attack spam. We outspeed but it takes three turns for Luxio to actually miss. It misses again on the fourth turn and goes down. We outspeed Miss Magius and land a sand attack before going down to Hex. Haunter is in and we have to hope it either outspeeds, survives a hit, or that Miss Magius uses Confuse Ray and we don't hit ourselves in confusion. Well, we don't outspeed, and I don't know if we would have survived a hit, but we don't hit ourselves in confusion and Miss Magius is cursed. Haunter goes down next turn and now it's all up to Krakalor. It doesn't look good, and I think we are likely to go down on either the same turn as Miss Magius or one turn earlier. Turn 1, Hex takes us from 78 down to 41 HP. We miss the burn. We're two turns from winning. Turn 2, Miss Magius confuses us. We hit ourselves in confusion. We now have 34 HP. We're one turn from winning. Turn 3. This is the final turn one way or another. Miss Magius hits us with Hex and we survive on 1 HP. But we're not out of the woods yet. Miss Magius won't die until the turn ends and we are confused. After a few seconds of unbearable tension, we manage to avoid knocking ourselves out on the very doorstep of victory, and the curse tick takes down Miss Magius. We win. Up next is another team star base and wheel status only everything but the star mobile. The trainer at the beginning of the base goes down without issue. Though Houndour repeatedly using raw is annoying. I'm not sure why the AI roars when incinerate is super effective, but it does. Base raiding still sucks. Mela leads with Torkoal. We lead with Haunter and curse it. Five turns later it goes down. Next is the Starmobile. I fucking hate these things. They technically aren't Pokemon and apparently that means they can just break any rule they want. But anyway, Dugtrio goes down and we bring out Hariyama. We use bulk up for a few turns since we're actually allowed to hit this thing. For some reason, 
the AI uses Screech on almost every turn. At first I thought this was because we were raising our defense every turn with bulk up and it prioritized lowering defense over doing damage. But looking back at the footage, it used Screech on turn 1. So that probably isn't it. Either way, it goes down a few turns later. God it feels good to hit these fucking things. Back to not hitting anything. And on to Orthworm, the lurking steel titan. Since Orthworm is steel, we cannot poison it. But we have other options, and good ones too. We lead with Krakalor and burn it. And there is no way it can one hit KO Skiplume, so we immediately swap. We need EXP so keeping Krakalor alive is ideal. We seed it but lose multiple turns to flinch. In the end it doesn't matter. At least right now, Skiplume is too good. We heal through with synthesis and round 1 ends. After chasing it a bit more, round 2 starts. This time we lead with Haunter and curse it. Thankfully it headbutts Oven's Toad School and we are able to swap in Skiplume and guarantee some EXP for Haunter. It hits Toad School again and for the first time this run, Arvin's Pokemon goes down before doing any damage to the Titan. But it doesn't matter. Skiplume is too good. We seed it, we sleep it, and we win. Skiplume hits level 27, and, after pretending it's Piccolo training for a big fight, evolves into Jumpluff. This game is broken in some wonderful ways. Also our best Pokemon just got even better. Before taking on the water gym, we take the time to catch and trade a Pincurch into the trainer in Levinchia. This gets us a Gengar and is 100% within the rules of this run. And it turns out this was even better than I thought because I didn't even remember that Perish Song was a move and Gengar is one of only three ways we have access to said move. Alteria would have it at level 44 if we delay evolving Swablu until then, otherwise it doesn't get it until 50. And Cricketune gets it at level 50. Gengar has it from the beginning. And this move is really good. If, after three turns, any Pokemon that hears the song is not swapped out of battle, it faints immediately. And this is a non-volatile status. It makes any trainer's final Pokemon a guaranteed win as long as we have enough HP left to tank the turns. Our final move set on Gengar is Curse, Hypnosis, Perish Song and mean look. At this point, it's our second best Pokemon after Jumpluff. On our way to the Water Gym Challenge, we happen upon a Grimer and pick it up for access to Toxic without having to lay down Toxic Spikes. I'm beginning to see that an issue with Toxic Spikes is that sometimes we might need to pivot to the Leech Seed, Sleep, Synthesis Strategy, or something else, mid-fight and if Toxic Spikes are down that isn't available since a Pokemon is poisoned immediately upon entering battle and can no longer be slept. And as we'll soon see, this is definitely a problem and toxic spikes will not see much use, if any at all, going forward. But that's a bit of foreshadowing. For now, we take down the gym trainer and get to test the Perish Song strat in the process. It's pretty damn good. After winning the auction, we head back to Kaskarafa to take on Kofu the water gym leader. On our first try we lead with Grimer and badly poison his Veluza. But this thing hits really hard. Grimer gets two shot and this one isn't off to the best of starts. And on top of that, there's a random sandstorm raging and doing chip damage to both of us. We swap to Clodsire and lay down a layer of toxic spikes. We only manage to get one down before Veluza takes us out. Our team actually really sucks against a water team. And Veluza has pluck so Jumpluff isn't safe either. Even though I know that Veluza will use pluck against Hariyama, I have to bring it in because I need Jumpluff and Gengar for the next two Pokemon and I'm almost certain that Krakalor will get one shot by Aquacutter, turns out it doesn't but whatever. Hariyama survives pluck at just under half health and Veluza goes down. We're low on Pokemon and Kofu still has two left. Vugtrio is next and we swap to Jumpluff because this is its time to shine. Vugtrio is poisoned on entry and immediately I realize that my feelings about Toxic Spikes being a bit bad were pretty spot on. 
I really want to leech seed and sleep it, but the best I can do is leech seed and hope to spam synthesis as much as possible. We get bad luck and lose a turn to flinch. Finally Vugtrio goes down with Jumpluff at an unhealthy 40 HP. Losing a synthesis turn to flinch really sucked. Kofu's final Pokemon is Crabominable. We send out Gengar because Perish Song is our only hope here. Once again the opposing Pokemon is poisoned on entry and I make a mental note to not use toxic spikes on this fight if I lose and have to do it again. Gengar is a very fast glass cannon and Crab Hammer will absolutely destroy us. But we do outspeed so Perish Song is ticking and we have a full health Krakalor, a half health Hariyama, and a half health Jumpluff. Oh and the Sandstorm is still chipping away at us. I promise this matters. We swap to Jumpluff, and, after I very stupidly try to sleep a poisoned Pokemon, Slam takes us down to 2 health. I know I should have used Synthesis but I now know that we outspeed in the matchup. At the end of the turn, Chip damage from Sandstorm takes us down. Hariyama goes down next turn. And Krakalor goes down on the turn after that. We were one turn from Perish Song taking the Crabominable down. Jumpluff would have won the fight if I hadn't made the mistake I did, or if there was no sandstorm. The second attempt is largely identical to the first. It even includes a use of toxic spikes when I meant to not use it anymore. But we let Veluza take down Krakalor early to buy time for bad poison to tick. They both go down on the same turn. The Jumpluff vs Vugtrio rematch goes much the same as before. This time we lose 3 turns to flinch but when Vugtrio goes down we have 43 HP, which is enough to survive Slam as long as it doesn't crit. Gengar sings its song and goes down. We swap back to Jumpluff and go for Leech Seed. In retrospect, Synthesis would probably have been safer here as it might have actually let us survive a crit. But Slam doesn't crit. Jumpluff is still a god. And we win. Honestly at the beginning of this challenge, I thought that Hopip would be really good early but fall off pretty hard pretty fast. We are now roughly halfway through this challenge and this thing is really fucking good. It's fast, has 4 status moves that actually matter, and it can heal itself 5 times in a battle. The only downside is that grass plus flying isn't the most ideal typing, and it'll be practically useless against anything with ice moves. But anyway. The team star poison base is next and we all know how much I love the stupid fucking star mobiles, so let's get to it. The fight outside the base is easy. The base raiding still sucks. And now we face off against Atticus. Even though he slightly outlevels us, his first three Pokemon go down without issue to our normal strategies. I'm allowed to hit the star mobile with direct damage moves and Atticus goes down. We only have two of these stupid bases left to deal with in the entire run. In Medali, we fight a few uninteresting trainers and pass the gym test. Now we get to face off against everyone's favorite trainer in Gen 9, Larry. His first Pokemon is Komala and we lead with Gengar. We outspeed it, and, as it turns out, it doesn't have a way to hit us anyway. And with Perish Song ticking, we use mean look because I don't know if the trainer AI is smart enough to swap to avoid death. We swap to Jumpluff and Komala goes down. Next is Dudunspass and we keep Jumpluff in. This turns out to be a big mistake. We miss Sleep Powder and get paralyzed by Glare. We are now outsped and we eat a Hyper Drill before actually landing Sleep. Finally we can safely swap to Gengar again but after using Perish Song we stay out one turn too long, Dudunspass wakes up, and we get paralyzed before going down to a super effective drill run. Jumpluff goes down soon after. Star Raptor is Larry's final Pokemon but we get there with very few options remaining. And none of them are great. Our best being that we hope for a quick claw proc with Grimer that lets us use Toxic before it lands an attack. This doesn't happen. We lose. Attempt 2 goes much the same. We lose. Attempt 3 ends really fast because we miss the sleep on Dudun's pass and reset. We need to land that. 
we need Gengar live going into Star Raptor. Attempt 4 goes much the same as Attempt 1. But this time the sleep lands and we get to Star Raptor with our entire team alive. I'll be honest, I still thought that the only shot we had was outspeeding. And while Gengar does have a higher base speed, it's not high enough to make up for the 5 level difference. But surprisingly, it doesn't matter, Gengar survives the aerial ace with 24 HP remaining, and we sing the song of our victory. And on top of that, cursed body prox and aerial ace is disabled for the next 4 turns. With aerial ace disabled, Hariyama can come in and tank a hit. In an effort to keep everyone alive for EXP, we swap to Claude Sire and tank another hit. The final tick of Perish Song takes Star Raptor down and we win. This fight was much more challenging than I thought it would be. But we can't rest just yet because Nimona wants to fight. There's really nothing all that interesting here. Toxic Spikes actually proves useful after a rough start that sees a turn 1 bite take Gengar down to 9 HP and it's pretty close at the end because of some misplays against Gumi and Meow Scarada's flower trick being a really fucking strong move. But we just barely managed to win. Man. Using ATM to teach Claude Sire rest earlier really saved us here. And with that win, we've impressed La Primera and we're off to Montenevera to take on the Ghost Gym. I have a strong feeling that we are going to need some levels before we manage to take this one down. With that said, I decide to do the gym challenge and try the battle against Rhyme because I want to know roughly how many levels we'll need to win. The three battles in the challenge go incredibly well. Perish Song is even better in double battles. There's really nothing to say. Outspeed or survive and use Perish Song. Stall until they all die. Win. Well now I'm feeling a lot better about our chances against Rhyme. She sends out Mimikyu and Barnett. We send out Gengar and Claude Sire. We're outleveled but only the Mimikyu outspeeds. We survive the Shadow Sneak and get a chance to use Perish Song. The AI seems to be unable to handle Perish Song, so as long as we survive three turns, Mimikyu and Barnett are guaranteed to go down. We do that, but run into the biggest problem our strategy has when it comes to double battles. Unlike in singles, we are not given the chance to swap in different Pokemon when Rhyme sends out her last two Pokemon. And, if we have Gengar out before Mimikyu and Barnett go down, Barnett, who cannot be slept due to the Insomnia ability, will prioritize using a super effective move and kill Gengar. But if we delay the switch until one of our Pokemon has gone down to her second duo, they will have already received the speed boost from the crowd and then Gengar is outsped and dies before using Perish Song. We lose here, and then lose here again. But I have a plan. If we can time it so that one of our Pokemon goes down to Barnett or Mimikyu on the same turn that Perish Song ticks down to zero and takes them out, we will have a chance to switch Gengar in on the same turn that she sends in Toxtricity and Houndstone. Then, as long as we outspeed both of them, we will be able to use Perish Song before Gengar goes down. So we sacrifice Hariyama and get to send Gengar in on turn one against her last duo. We also swap in Krakalor to preserve as much HP as possible on Claude Sire, which turns out to be a really good move. Well, after an annoyingly long Terra Starlizing cutscene, we arrive at the moment of truth. Do we outspeed both of her Pokémon even though we are pretty underleveled? We do. And with Perish Song ticking, we just try to survive. We almost don't. But Jumpluff sleeps Toxtricity and Claude Sire is the cutest, beefiest boy ever. We win. I'm genuinely surprised we won this one without needing to gain a few levels. With badge number 6 in the bag, we head off to fight Great Tusk, the Quaking Earth Titan. So far the Titans have been the easiest encounters in this challenge and this one is no different. In round 1 we curse it with Gengar, who then goes down to a super effective knockoff. But we just sleep and seed it with Jumpluff and a few turns later it goes down. We heal and return for round 2. Once again we lead with Gengar who gets curse off before going down to a super effective stomping tantrum. And once again, Jumpluff comes in to sleep it and seed it. 
With the nice addition of Arvin Scavillan providing a few super effective razor leafs, the penultimate titan goes down just a few turns later. And now we have a bit of a problem. The next gym is the psychic gym in Alforanada and pretty much our entire team is weak to psychic moves. So not only are we significantly underleveled for the next gym, we are also at a severe type disadvantage. Even our tank is weak to psychic. So I do a bit of team expansion on the way to Alforanada. First I pick up a Stunky. Being immune to psychic moves while having access to toxic sounds pretty good right about now. I also pick up a Gabite on the way. I don't know if we'll ever use it, but it doesn't hurt to have it in storage just in case. Plus the catch is good XP and we need that too. We arrive at Alforanada and the team expansion doesn't stop just yet. We pick up a level 43 Shanzi as another tanking option and we also pick up a level 41 Altaria. This one seems good because at level 50 it will give us another Pokemon that can use Perish Song. And this will certainly help protect Gengar against some of its weaker type matchups. With the team properly expanded, we spend around an hour slowly catching and or knocking out wild Pokemon in order to gain some levels. This is slow as fuck and very tedious. Stunky evolves into Skuntank. But due to two of Tulip's Pokemon having fairy type moves and me not remembering that Skuntank only takes one times damage against fairy, I decide to catch a level 40 Swablu and level it to 44 without letting it evolve into Altaria. The goal is to have Perish Song while avoiding the weakness to fairy that Altaria would have. 25 minutes, 11 Gotharitas, and 1 Dak spun later, Swablu hits 44 and we're ready to go get our 7th badge. Except I set the party up entirely for the tulip fight and forgot that we have to fight Nimona first. We try our best but eventually lose to Nimona. I believe we would have won if Jumpluff hadn't lost a turn to paralysis against Pormat. But thankfully this is another fight we're allowed to lose. We then play the R, uh, Rhythm. Game, Gym, Challenge. The back-to-back -back trainer battles with no heal between them are a bit of a challenge. And I'm no longer sure that the Swablu Dator was entirely worth it. Jumpluff is still god tier though. We pass the test and head into the fight with Tulip. She leads with Farijaraf and we lead with Swablu. We're outsped but survive a Zen headbutt and get Perish Song off. We keep Swablu in and it goes down to another Zen headbutt. It did its job though. We then bring in Jumpluff and immediately land asleep. The Perish Song count ticks to zero and Farijaraf goes down. We keep Jumpluff in against Gardevoir. We need to save Gengar for Florges and I still don't remember that Skuntank isn't at a type disadvantage in this fight. We sleep and seed Gardevoir before swapping to Shanzi. We eat two psychics that don't do much thanks to Shanzi's high special defense, and on our next turn we put Gardevoir back to sleep. We then use Light Screen to make Psychic do even less to us, and, a few turns later, Gardevoir goes down to Leech Seed. Esparthra is next and we switch back to Jumpluff. It goes down easy to the good old Sleep Seed Synthesis Strat. Her last Pokemon is Florges and we bring in Gengar. We outspeed, and, with Perish Song now ticking, our victory is guaranteed. Gengar goes down. We swap to Jumpluff for a sleep and seed. Swap Shanzi to keep Jumpluff alive because we need XP. And Florges goes down. We now have our 7th gym badge. Shanzi evolves into Blissey and I'm entirely sure that I overprepared for this one. And I'm even more sure that Swablu was a waste of time and resources. Our next stop is the ice gym in Glaciado. But there's no way we're winning this one. We rely on Jumpluff a lot in pretty much every fight and being grass flying means that it is four times weak to ice moves. So once again, and hopefully for the last time, we go on a journey to expand our party. We have at least three guaranteed KOs with two Perish Song users since Gengar outspeeds everything Grusha has and other than Earthquake from Bertic, I don't think anything one-shots unless it crits. 
so we need something that is survivable against ice and water types and preferably has some access to good status moves. Bonus points if it has a self heal as well. I'll give you a few seconds to guess which Pokemon I decide to pick up. Of course it's Marini with the goal of evolving it into Toxapex. Now the problem is that the highest level Marini are level 22 and it evolves at 38 and we need it to be closer to 50 to be useful. But look at this, we're so lucky, there's a level 37 Wild Terra Toxapex right here. We'll just get that and be on our way. No. We won't. Because even though the tooltip says you'll need to reduce its HP to break through its transformation first, only then can you catch it, it actually means, you must do direct damage to the Pokemon in order to break through its transformation. If you perish song it, it dies. If you leech seed it, it dies. If you any damaging status move it, it dies. It is uncatchable with only status moves. So we now have to level this Marini from 22 to somewhere between 45 and 50. Oh boy. The best place for XP right now is around Casroy Lake. All of the Pokemon here are level 50 to 55. While OBS randomly decided to stop recording, I picked up a level 54 Altaria to replace the Swablu we wasted time on earlier. After about 45 minutes and using all of the EXP candies I had picked up, Marini finally evolves into Toxapex. But we still need some more levels. Luckily, while doing this for over an hour, I discovered that the wild scum tanks in this area use Memento and Explosion a lot. If we lead with Gengar, we're immune to Explosion and Memento doesn't matter anyway. This means a lot of one-turn fights and makes it by far the fastest EXP gain available to us. We catch a level 53 Stunky with the goal of evolving it and replacing our current Scum Tank. We also catch an Amoongus and a Dreadnought. I don't know if they'll be useful but it doesn't hurt to have them. Stunky evolves. We feed Toxapex 5 rare candies and get it to level 47. And now we're ready to go get our 8th and final gym badge. This one is a complete stomp. Gengar Perish songs the Froz Moth. Skeledurge tanks it until it goes down. Altaria Perish songs the Bear Tick and goes down to Icicle Crash. Scum Tank comes in and we spam smoke screens on Bear Tick. It misses Earthquake three times in a row and goes down. Gengar comes back in and Perish songs the Sutite in. Ice Spinner doesn't KO Gengar. We swap to Toxapex. It tanks until Sutitin goes down. Gengar comes back in once again to Perish Song the Altaria. Hurricane misses. We swap to Blissey and tank until Altaria goes down. We win. Though I have a feeling that the biggest challenges are yet to come. But first, we go and crush the Team Star Fairy base. Well actually, we lose once because I smooth brain my way into the fight against Ortega without having an attacking move to kill the car. Next up is the final titan, the false dragon titan. We find the right Tatsugiri and start round one of the fight. Nothing interesting or challenging here. Though because I know I'm far enough ahead, I waste a turn just to test if Perish Song works against titans. It doesn't. But Curse does, and Jumpluff tanks until we win. In round 2, we're once again joined by Arvin. This time he brings Greedent. We curse with Gengar and swap to Jumpluff to seed and tank. Greedent goes down but it doesn't matter. We win. And we immediately start our fight against the real false dragon titan, Tatsugiri. Gengar curses and goes down to a dragon pulse. Jumpluff seeds and tanks. On the last turn we swap to Blissey to make sure that Jumpluff stays alive and gets some EXP. Now we've defeated every titan and Karaidan can climb. We raid the team star fighting base and then start our fight against Eri. She leads with Toxicroak and we immediately perish song with Gengar. We can actually keep Gengar in for at least one more turn because the AI will keep trying to use Sucker Punch since it is super effective against Gengar. But we're not attacking, so it does nothing to us. 
so we sleep Toxicroak and then waste one more turn with Gengar before swapping to Toxapex. The Toxicroak wakes up but the AI really likes Sucker Punch. Her first Pokemon is down, and we've taken zero damage. Lucario is next. We cannot use Altaria until the Starmobile, so we send Gengar in, even though we're at a type disadvantage. We outspeed but miss sleep. Lucario gets a turn, but thankfully Dark Pulse doesn't kill, and Gengar lands sleep the next turn. And, with Perish Song ticking, we switch back to Toxapex. Lucario wakes up and we're outsped. It lands two Dragon Pulses but on the last turn we're able to use Recover to heal to almost full. She sends out Persimian and I have to alter the plan a bit. I need Altaria for the Starmobile as it has one of my only two attack moves and Gengar is on low health so instead of trying for Perish Song, I send in Scun Tank and go for a Toxic and Tank strategy. The Toxic part works just fine but Close Comeback takes Scun Tank down in two. I send in Skeledurge, and, even though Rock Tomb is super effective, we survive three hits and Persimian goes down to Toxic. Annihilate, by far her strongest and scariest Pokemon, is next. We send in Gengar and Perish Song before going down to Rage Fist. Toxapex tanks and we use Recover to survive enough turns for the Annihilate to go down. Toxapex can do nothing against the Starmobile and goes down. We bring in Altaria, and, since we're allowed to attack and use items here, we Cotton Guard and use items to survive while doing damage with Sky Attack. I think this was the wrong move to bring, and also swapping to Jumpluff was a complete waste of turns, but it still worked and the last Team Star base is complete. We never have to see the stupid fucking cars again. Hooray. Now we have access to the Elite Four the final Arvin fight, and the Clavel plus Cassiopeia fights. These are all roughly the same level, so it doesn't really matter what order we do them in. But the plan is to do the Elite Four last because, even though we are roughly equivalent in level to each Elite Four member, beating them ends with a fight against Gita and we are not at a level to take her on yet. But before going any further, we go on a stake-pulling journey because we really need Wochian. Eight stakes and a few resets later, we have our Wochian and we're ready to make some progress. With the Elite Four and Gita being saved for last, we go for the Arvin fight first. Here's his team, and here's ours. Even though we're underleveled, the fight actually goes pretty well until his Toad Scroll. This thing is pretty scary. We lose a few times and this Toad Scroll is an absolute brick wall. Time to get a few levels. After about an hour of wild scun tank grinding, our team now looks like this. And even with the extra levels, we still manage to lose again, because we miss too many sleeps on Toad Scroll and it rips us to shreds. But finally we get an attempt that goes close enough to plan that we are able to get the win. Altaria first turn sleeps the Greedent and then uses Perish Song. We send in Wochian to seed and tank. Greedent goes down and we still have a decent amount of health. We bring Altaria back in and first turn Perish Song the Scavillain. It has nothing that can kill us even if it crits, so we don't risk the sleep attempt first. We swap to Skuntank and Smoke Scream forces two misses. Before going down, Scavillain finally lands a Fire Blast and it almost kills. But a barely alive Skuntank is all we need. Garganical is next and this one is honestly pretty scary as well. It has the purifying salt ability which makes it immune to all non-volatile status effects. We can still perish song it, but it has super effective moves against Altaria and Gengar. We send out Altaria and survive after using perish song because the Garganical uses stealth rock. This kind of sucks because of the amount of swapping we do, but it's still better than a dead Altaria. Slowbro comes into tank but Garganical outspeeds and Slowbro goes down before being able to use Slack off to heal. Our barely alive Skun tank comes in and just barely survives the damage from the stealth rocks. But once again, barely alive is all we need. Garganical KOs Skun tank and Perish Song KOs Garganical. And then something annoying happens that will happen multiple times going forward. 
for some reason the game doesn't tell me who Arvin is sending out next. And this really matters. I carefully planned out these late game fights before going in, looking for exact matchups on every turn to ensure the best chance for survival. But now I just have to guess who is next. If it's Cloyster, I want Gengar. If it's Toad Scroll, I want Altaria. I guess, and send out Gengar. The 50-50 is in my favor this time and Arvin sends out Cloyster. Since it doesn't have anything that kills on turn 1, even risking the sleep doesn't feel useful here, so we turn 1 Perish Song. Liquidation doesn't kill and we swap to Toxapex. Cloyster outspeeds but has nothing that is even effective against us. Leftovers and some overly safe recovers keep us alive until Cloyster goes down. Toad Scroll is next and even though Arvin still has Mapper Stiff, it really all comes down to this. We turn one Perish Song again. Toad Scroll outspeeds and hits us with Sludge Bomb. We're poisoned. We're now at low enough health that swapping Altaria out would mean that it would go down to Stealth Rock if we swap it in again, so we just keep it in and let it go down. We send Toxapex into tank and Toad Scroll goes down. Mabastiff is next, and, as long as Gengar outspeeds and the sleep lands, we win. Gengar outspeeds. The sleep lands. Perish song is ticking. Mabastiff finally wakes up and takes Gengar down with a crunch. But we only need to survive one more turn and we have two living Pokemon. Play rough doesn't kill Wochian and we win. This was one of the more difficult fights in this run so far. But the worst is yet to come. But first, we dumpster Clavel and Penny. I'm really not even going to talk about them. They were never close. They were never interesting. The only thing scary about Clavel's team is his Quarkwaval. And I think Penny would have been a challenging fight if the AI didn't love using baby doll eyes over moves that actually do damage. She has fast Pokemon and decent type coverage on each evolution. I spent quite a while coming up with a plan to get through the fight. But in the end it didn't even matter. She goes down without knocking out a single Pokemon on our team. And now our only path forward is the Elite Four. But we still aren't ready for that. First we need to pick up some new team members and get them levels. Some of the members we already have also need some levels. None of this is really for the Elite Four themselves though additions like Copper Arja will certainly help there as well. All of this is because at the end we face off against Gita, and her team is just really fucking frightening. Also because we don't get healed between Elite 4 members, we need to do some shopping. This is also where all of the item pickups help us. We have a few PP ups that we can use on Perish Song. We have enough PP restoring items that it wouldn't be a problem anyway, but hey, better safe than sorry. A few hours of wild scum tank grinding and one reset due to a forgotten shopping trip later, we finally start our journey through the Elite Four. The first member of the Elite Four is Rika and this is the matchup against her. Since her Pokemon all have ground moves, we're really only bringing Gengar as a last resort. We lose on our first attempt because I forget to perish Song Camerupt before swapping to Blissey. On attempt 2, we lead with Altaria and immediately land sleep on Wizkash and then perish song it. Wizkash only has special moves so we swap to Blissey to sleep and then, on the last turn that Wizkash is alive, we set up light screen because we know that Camerupt is coming out next and it is also all special. We swap back to Altaria for Camerupt. With light screen up, it cannot do any meaningful damage so we don't waste time trying to sleep it. And with Perish Song now ticking, we swap back to Blissey to sleep and waste turns until Camerupt goes down. Donphan is next and once again we send in Altaria. We're still healthy enough that Stone Edge cannot one-shot us unless it crits so we just go straight for Perish Song and swap in Slowbro to tank. Donphan goes down a few turns later. Dugtrio is next and thankfully it uses Sandstorm because it outspeeds and Rock Slide would have killed Altaria. But we perish Song it and swap to Slowbro. Dugtrio goes down on the same turn that it KOs Slowbro. 
Rika only has one Pokemon left and thankfully we know beforehand that it is Clodsire, because the text telling us what the next Pokemon will be is once again skipped for some fucking reason. Both of our Perish Song users are still alive. Victory is guaranteed since both Altaria and Gengar outspeed Clodsire. Next is Poppy and this is the matchup against her. Our first attempt ends quickly to some missed sleeps. All of her Pokemon have steel moves which aren't all that scary to our lineup, but she leads with a Copper Archer that knows high horsepower so we have to lead Altaria because we need Gengar for the rest of the fight. We don't risk the sleep and just use Perish Song. Thankfully Copper Archer uses Stealth Rock, which will certainly put some meaningful HP pressure on us due to all the swapping we do, but is still better than a dead Altaria. We swap to Wochian and for some reason the Copper Archer doesn't use Play Rough against us even though it is super effective. Wochian just barely survives and Copper Archer goes down. Corviknight is next and we perish Song with Gengar. Brave Bird does a ton of damage and Stealth Rock is starting to put meaningful pressure on our HP. We swap to Skeledurge who survives long enough for Corviknight to go down. We send in Altaria against her Bronzong because we need to keep Gengar alive. We use Altaria's last Perish Song against Bronzong, and now our 59 HP Gengar needs to survive two swap-ins while Stealth Rock is active. We immediately drop to 36 HP on swap-in. I noticed that on the last attempt, Magnezone led with light screen so I immediately perish song and hope that the AI has a tendency to use that move. Maybe it does, because once again light screen comes out. We swap to Blissey and tank because Magnezone is all special. On the last turn that Magnezone is still alive, I decide to use Healing Wish. In the heat of the moment, I did not notice how much damage Gengar took on Swapin and didn't want to risk the damage ending, this, attempt. And I know that the healing from that move has priority over Stealth Rock. I now know that Gengar would have survived on 13 HP without the healing, but better safe than resetting. We have 4 Pokemon alive and Tinketun only has 3 turns of life so we win. Next is Larry, who is now a flying type trainer and this is the matchup against him. This one is a simple sleep, perish song, tank fight. Nothing to talk about. Larry goes down easy. The final member of the Elite Four is Hassel. This is the matchup. Going in, I thought this one might be pretty challenging. It honestly wasn't. Against Baxcalibur, his final Pokemon, Copper Arja gets three protects in a row. But even without that, we still would have had the one guaranteed protect on Copper Arja and one guaranteed protect on Toxapex. So, with no way to lose, we win. But the good feelings don't last long. Our reward for beating the Elite Four is getting to go up against Gita, the hardest fight in this entire challenge. And it's not even close. This shit is brutal. This is the matchup against her. On top of having some pretty incredible type coverage, the AI is also actually kind of smart enough to use the useful things almost all the time. For the next hour, we lose to her a lot, and it's rarely even close. But this is already getting way too long, so I won't go into all the failed attempts. After well over an hour of losing, we switch up our team and things start to feel a bit better. We have a decent number of attempts that get pretty deep into her lineup. But these all end at King Gambit. We also have some attempts that end immediately because we miss two straight sleeps on Esparthra. But, if we can solve King Gambit, it feels like we have a chance. After resetting to missed sleeps on Esparthra, we finally land a turn one sleep. We perish song and swap to Blissey. Esparthra is three out of four special moves. So even if it wakes up, Blissey is in a good place to survive. And we need it to survive. It wakes up immediately. Lumina Crash barely even tickles, but it does drop our special defense by two stages. The next one hurts more, but we light screen. On its last turn alive, Esparthra hits us with a quick attack, and we use Soft Boiled to heal to almost full. Arvalug is next and this one is pretty damn scary as well. 
It has an ice move and a ground move which means that both of our perish songers are at risk of being one shot by it. So we need to sleep it turn one. And Altaria does just that. But it wakes up on the next turn and we just barely survive a super effective avalanche. We swap to Slowbro who is just tanky enough to survive two super effective crunches and heal back up to two thirds HP before Avalug goes down. And now it's time for King Gambit, and the solution is Wochian. Starting off both signature abilities trigger. King Gambit's is Supreme Overlord and it gives a 10% boost to the power of King Gambit's moves for each ally that has fainted. So in this case it is getting an extra 20%. Wochian's is Tablets of Ruin, and it reduces the attack stat of all Pokemon on the field other than itself by 25%. King Gambit is all physical so cutting its attack by that much effectively negates all of the gains from Supreme Overlord. We immediately leech seed. We're pretty beefy and only need to survive 9 total turns. Iron Head hurts but we heal about half of the damage back with leech seed. On our next turn we stun Spore. The chance that it loses turns to paralysis is nice. But really we just needed to use Iron Head again before we can start truly putting our solution into effect. We're at roughly 2 thirds HP and we can finally begin. We use Spite and burn 4 pp of Iron Head. It is a 15 pp move and King Gambit has already used 2. It now sits at 9 uses remaining. It Iron Heads us again. It's now at 8. We Spite it again and it's now at 4. It uses it again and it is now at 3. We spite it again and it is at 0. But because moves are selected simultaneously, King Gambit was allowed to choose the move before we took all of its uses away. This results in King Gambit using the move but there being no effect because there is no PP left for the move. We get a free turn of damage and heal from Leech Seed. It won't choose Zen Head but because that does 0 damage to us due to our dark typing. So King Gambit now has to use either Kowtow Cleave or Stone Edge. Both of these are 5 PP moves, so I bet you can see where this is going. We waste our turn and it uses Kowtow Cleave. It's not very effective. On the next turn we use Spite. It's now out of Kowtow Cleave. But luckily for it, this time it chose Stone Edge. But it doesn't kill us. It now has 0 uses of Kowtow Cleave and 4 uses of Stone Edge left. We spite away the last uses of Stone Edge. It is now entirely out of moves that can do damage to us and it goes down to Leech Seed. We successfully solved the hardest part of the hardest encounter in this entire challenge. But it isn't over. She has 3 Pokemon left and I almost throw it all away. Next is Gagoat. It has both a psychic and a fairy move, so we need to land the sleep on it or it will kill either Gengar or Altaria. Altaria's sleep lands. But a one turn sleep could still end this attempt. Thankfully it stays asleep and we swap Altaria out after using Perish Song. We send in Copper Arja because it's in this team exclusively to deal with Gagot and it does just that. Next is Veluza, and here's where I almost throw. Instead of just perish songing with Altaria and accepting that it will go down right after, I try to sleep the Veluza. Sleep misses, Altaria dies. Fuck. Gengar has to clutch this. But Veluza has Psycho Cut and Gengar is a lot of things, but Tanky is not one of those. We have to go for the sleep. It lands. We perish song. Its eyes open. My stomach drops. My palms are sweaty. My knees are weak, my arms are heavy. Mom's spaghetti. But somehow Gengar actually survives the psycho cut and we're still in this. Slowbro tanks Veluza and slack off heals to full on the last turn. Glimra is last and Gengar outspeeds. Even though Gita warns us not to think we've won just yet, we are guaranteed the win at this point and it feels so very fucking good. With Gita down, all we have left is our last battle against Nimona, the battle against A.I. Sada, and the final fight against Koridan. None of these even come close to being on the same level as Gita. Next up is Nimona. This is the matchup against her. 
she leads with Lycanroc and it starts the fight with Stealth Rock, so, once again, with all of the swapping we do, we're under HP pressure early on. We use the same Wochian Spite strategy that we used on Dita's King Gambit and it loses multiple turns to Paralyze. Lycanroc goes down. We miss sleep on Pormat and Gengar survives on 11 HP. Our sleep lands on the next turn and we follow it with Perish Song. Pormat doesn't wake up and we swap to Skeledurge. It wakes up on the swap in and manages to freeze us after two ice punches. But it goes down before it can take Skeledurge with it. Orthworm is next and we swap in Altaria. Sleep lands immediately. We perish song and it wakes up but it misses an iron tail. We swap to Slowbro and tank it until it goes down. The stealth rock is starting to seriously put pressure on us. Dudun's pass is next. Altaria lands sleep on the first turn. We follow it with Perish Song, and the Dudun's pass wakes up and takes Altaria out with a Dragon Rush. These one-turn sleeps are really not helping our already strained HP pool. We swap to Slowbro and use Yawn to set up for a free final turn recover. We just barely survive Hyper Drill, but it goes to bed, and then it goes to dead. Hagudra is next, Altaria is dead, and Gengar cannot be swapped in until we can healing wish into it. So we bring in Blissey to set up a light screen, sleep the Gudra, and then healing wish into Gengar. We perish song and Gudra wakes up. But light screen protects us from being brought low enough to worry about dying to the swap in against her final Pokemon, so we can even afford a turn to try to sleep it again. It lands. Slowbro comes in and Gudra goes down. Last, but certainly not least, is Meow Scarada. This thing is scary. We have four Pokemon alive, and we need to survive four turns. On top of that, all four of our Pokemon are at a type disadvantage here and three of them will almost certainly die in one hit. But it should be okay. Gengar is in, and we think about the 60% sleep for a few moments but ultimately decide to just Perish Song and hope for the best. We outspeed so Perish Song turns are ticking, but we go down immediately after to a super effective Shadow Claw. We need to survive three turns with three Pokemon while at a type disadvantage. Skeledurge is next and goes down to Shadow Claw. We have two Pokemon and need to survive two turns. Slowbro is next and goes down to Flower Trick. We have one Pokemon and need to survive one turn. As long as Wochian isn't one shot by Play Rough, we win this. It isn't a one shot and we win this. First try. I genuinely thought this one would be more of a challenge. But we took her down even with first move Stealth Rock and a metric fuck ton of one turn sleeps working against us. After a bunch of story stuff and some face roll 2v1s against Paradox Pokemon, we face off against the final boss of this run. AI Sada. This is the matchup against her. As you can see, she has a full team of Paradox Pokemon and they are all strong. But honestly most of them are easily solved with our team. Only Fluttermane and Roaring Moon are a real problem. They both have super effective moves against both of our Perish Song users and I know that Fluttermane outspeeds Gengar. But in the end, this one was never really all that close and it definitely was not interesting enough to warrant a full play-by-play. -play. The only scary part was finding out if Gengar was able to survive a Shadow Ball from Fluttermane. It can. It does. Barely. But barely is all that you need when you're backed up by a Healing Wish Blissey. Gengar is back to full on the swap in against Roaring Moon, her final Pokemon. We outspeed, and, even though we go down to Night Slash, Perish Song is ticking its way to our victory. Wochian tanks the last few turns and Sada goes down. We are only allowed to use Koridan against Koridan the Guardian of Paradise, so, much like the Starmobiles, we are forced to use moves that cause direct damage to win. The credits roll. Ed Sheeran sings. And we did it. So. Can you beat Pokemon Scarlet using only non-damaging status moves? Mostly. Almost entirely. 
But there are six fights in the game that you cannot win with status moves, no matter how hard you try. Five of those fights aren't even against Pokemon. And for the sixth one you aren't even allowed to choose your team. But whether you consider this run a success or not, it was a lot of fun, and I'm already in the planning process for my next challenge run. Thanks for watching. Bye.